What if I told you that for about 35 British pounds, you could get a gorgeous looking box of mysteries set in the world of Sherlock Holmes, filled with genuine intrigue, smart and funny writing, and most importantly, some excellent cases to crack. If that excites you, then I've got some good news for you, as there's now four boxes in the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective series, which means that if you're new to this fantastic set of games, then there's a whopping 40 full-fledged stories for you to experience and mysteries for you to solve. Now that, in its own right, is a fantastic thing. Let me just be upfront by saying that the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective series is an incredible collection of games that 100% deserves your attention. If you have even a passing interest in detective games, which seems to be an absurdly popular genre for board game fans around the world. But that brings us on to the new kid on the block, or should I say kids on the block, the Baker Street Irregulars. A box so good that I think it may have actually raised the bar of the series as a whole and could be the perfect introduction to the consulting detective games if you're new to it and a must buy if you're a long time fan. Okay, let's rewind a little bit. What exactly is Consulting Detective and what makes it stand out from the rest of the crowd of crime-solving cardboard boxes out there? First of all, let me show you what's in a Consulting Detective box. The Baker Street Irregulars and all of its predecessors come with a series of props that acts as tools for your investigation. First, there's the big boy in the center of the table, an intricate map of central London split into regions and dotted with numerical addresses that allow you to visit anywhere in London as part of your investigation. Everything you do in Consulting Detective will be tied to a location on this map, which is then turned into code by combining the number of the block of buildings with the region that it's in. So, for example, if I wanted to head to Scotland Yard to dunk on Lestrade and call him an idiot, then I can find Scotland Yard on the map which is number 13 Southwest, and then turn to the most important of our tools, the casebook. Every case in the box is contained in one of these casebooks, which provides the introduction to the mystery, the questions that you'll need to answer to earn points at the end of the game, and a full explanation of how Sherlock himself managed to crack it. In between these sections of the book, though, is the meat of the game. For every location that you'll be able to visit as part of your investigation, you'll turn to the relevant section of the book with that location's code. So to follow our earlier example, turning to 13 Southwest, we'll find a usually frantic and overworked Inspector Lestrade who will hopefully divulge some important information on what we're searching for. Hopefully is the operative word though, as be warned, not every section of the book is relevant and some will even be intentionally misleading red herrings to throw you off the track. If you ever need to track down some of the regular faces that Sherlock would routinely check in with as part of his investigations, you can consult the list of informants in the box. These will likely be your most useful leads, so keep them in the front of your mind and weighing up where to go next. You might knock on the door of H.R. Murray, the criminologist, for some analysis of substances and items found at crime scenes, Langdale Pike for some high society gossip, or old Porky Shimwell at the Rhett and Raven pub, who might have some info on any dodgy dealings or underworld activity happening on the streets. If there's anyone not on your immediate list of contacts that you need an address for, you can consult the London Directory for a comprehensive list of the residents and business addresses of central London. Names are alphabetized, but you can head to the back of the book for business addresses, broken down by type from theatres to tobacconists, furriers, printers, and prisons. Finally, every case in the box is accompanied by that morning's edition of the Times newspaper for you to browse the comings and goings of London, as well as important events from around the country and even the rest of the world. The newspapers are usually a pretty vital tool for finding specific suspects and background information on your cases, but they're also littered with nonsense, which can make them pretty tricky to pass. With all those bits and bobs at your disposal, the game is delightfully easy to play. You'll be given your preamble at the start of the book, and then where you choose to go, who you choose to speak to, and even when you choose to end the adventure is completely up to you. To further the story, you just pick a location to visit, mark the code down as one of your leads that you followed, unless that entry isn't in the book, and then you take your notes on the information that you find. If you reckon you've run out of information to hunt or you're just sure that you've cracked the case, you simply turn to the back of the book upside down and you'll be faced with two series of questions. The first set will always ask for the specific hows and whys of the main story, 
but to make up some extra points, you can also give the second set a go, which are usually concerned with some extra details that only the truly keen-eyed would have picked up, or one or two side quest conundrums that are optionally solvable additions to the main story. That second series of questions will prove vital to those that tend to try and trawl every little piece of evidence that they can before facing the solution at the end, as the game will not only give you a points-based score, but you'll also be compared to the room-pacing, monologue-delivering namesake of the game himself. Sherlock, who provides the full breakdown of the case at the end of each book, always scores 100 points, and usually in a ridiculously small amount of leads followed. Once you've totted up all the points you've received for answering the questions correctly, you'll also need to count how many leads you followed and compare them to Sherlock's total. For every single lead that you followed more than Holmes, you'll be deducted five points from your final score. Or if you're some kind of detective demigod, you'll gain five for every lead less than him that you followed instead. Don't worry though, it's very unlikely that you'll ever need to worry about outperforming Sherlock when it comes to efficiency. But if you're smart and pay attention to anything that could help with the second set of questions, you might just outscore him and break the 100 mark. It can be done. Take it from old gumshoe wheels here. So if you're sold by that premise, then the logical conclusion is that you go straight for whichever box came out first. For those of you who are interested now, that goes by uh, the name of the Thames murders and other cases. It might not be that simple though, because not only do I think that Dave Neal's contribution to the series might be the best one yet, it's also introduced a few key features that might make it a much more welcoming first box for new players. So let's talk about the Baker Street Irregulars itself. The 10 cases contained within this lovely green box centre themselves around the titular group led by Wiggins, who, despite being the group that you supposedly play as in each of the Sherlock boxes, have until now never fully been explored. You'll continue to see each case from their perspective, but with some new additions to the cast to give Wiggy a helping hand, including Simpson the matchstick seller and Tinker the mudlark. Halfway through the box, you'll even introduce a new character to the entourage who brings a case to Sherlock along with their adorable little dog. This motley crew, combined with the reappearing cast of characters that make up your informants list, become like close friends throughout the box. You find yourself really caring about them as little hints of their character and glimpses at their past pop up amongst the text. I can't stress enough just how good the writing is in this box. As I mentioned before, there's an absolute mountain of detective board games out there, and they're always so focused on having some kind of gimmick to them. Piles and piles of cards, QR codes, semi-cooperative play, you name it, it's probably been tried in one of these games. And don't get me wrong, I'm not going to tell you that these are all bad games and Sherlock is the only one you should care about, but holy crap, there is a gulf in quality between the writing in both boxes. I've played a game in a similar style where if you see a massive paragraph of text, you all sort of sigh and just think, Christ, come on then, let's go on with it. But when I see a massive section of text in one of these cases, I'm euphoric. It's more hints at the case, yes, but it's also more characterization for the cast, more stupid voices for me to read out of NPC dialogue, and more great little jokes and snapshots of Victorian melancholy. From what I've seen, the writing has always been good in Consulting Detective, and credit where credit is due to the original creators, Gary Grady and Suzanne Goldberg, but Dave Neal, without a doubt, carries the accolade for best Sherlock writer in my book, and I really hope he puts out another box in the future. Stellar wordsmithing is not all that makes this box stand out though, as a whole host of quality of life improvements have been made to make things smoother and more forgiving for new players. First of all, there's the player aid, which is new to the games as of this set, as well as a slightly more detailed and illustrated look at your list of informants, which generally just makes them a little bit easier to peruse. On the reverse side, you'll find an alphabetical code for each of the 10 cases, which you can tick off whenever you reach a certain trigger in the story. There was a running problem with previous Sherlock games whereby if you didn't follow the leads in near enough the exact order that you were supposed to, then you'd often jump into bits of the investigation without proper context and be confused as to what the characters were talking about. In the Baker Street Regulars, you'll find sections of the text that are locked away unless you have one of those letters on your player aid circled. By adding in what are essentially checkpoints whenever you learn something of note, be it a new name, a new piece of evidence, or in some cases a new tool for you to use, you'll always see the main beats of the story in the right order. 
This is also great for new players because not only does it give you a hint that you've just learned something potentially really important, as there's now new sections of leads you've already read to go back to and read, you feel like you've cracked a miniature section of the case and a new avenue of investigation is opened up whenever you circle one of those letters. The letter check marks also allow Neil to do some clever things mechanically in the book as well that remind me of Choose Your Own Adventure game Legacy of Dragonhole. The check marks in the book allow you to make divergent choices in the story itself. One example sees you discovered as you try and sneak into a building with the rest of the gang and you're chased down the street. But because this has happened, and as the game knows this, seeing as you circled a letter, you can now go back to the same building and search it because the people inhabiting are still out searching for you. There's a greater sense of weight to the leads that you follow now and you feel much more involved in the story rather than a silent bystander only there to observe. A great example of how this can be really useful is in the visiting Sherlock mechanic that's been around since the first box. If you're ever really stuck in any of the cases from the first three sets, you can visit 22 on Baker Street and Holmes will give you some hints as to where you're supposed to be focusing your investigations. The problem with this though is that because in previous games the box had no idea where in the story you were, you could have the majority of the case pretty much completely spoiled for you with no real way of telling how much you were going to skip by asking for a hint. In Baker Street Regulars though, Holmes will give you a number of sections all marked by those letters that you've found so far, meaning you'll only get hints if you've already received the information needed to be able to figure out what he's telling you for yourself. Clever. These boxes will always live and die by the cases inside them, and it's difficult to tell you about what you're going to face without getting into spoiler territory. I can tell you that there's kidnappings, murders, organized crime, political intrigue, corporate espionage, and much, much more. I really enjoyed the fact that Dave Neal dipped into just how dangerous it was to be a kid in Victorian England, with references to the Children's Charter and other events popping up in the newspapers over time. What's more useful though is that I can say, apart from maybe one of them, every case in this box had thoroughly entertained me from start to finish and completely had me enraptured by the mysteries that they present, with my favourite three being the Red River Valley, which introduces some intercontinental intrigue, uh, the Promise, which delves into the backstory of one of the main characters in the box, and the epic finale, The Death of a Detective. All throughout these cases, there were moments that completely flipped everything on its head. The cases never being as simple as they seem, with the finale itself being a real pièce de résistance, with multiple weaving storylines converging together, reappearances from previous cast members from older cases, and a fantastic finish with multiple possible endings depending on how you did. This box is an absolute must-buy for me. I can't even begin to express just how much fun I've had with it. Even to the point that now I'm going back to old boxes to get my next fix, I'm finding them slightly wanting, even if they are still enjoyable. If you have even a passing interest in crimes and capers, Victorian England, Sherlock, or just some great writing, then I urge you to go out and grab this box. It is an absolute treat. Thank you so much for watching this review of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, The Baker Street Irregulars, one of the longest board game titles I've ever had to say on this channel. I hope I got across what makes this box so special without spoiling too much of its contents. And if you're interested to find out more, there's links in the description for you to have a look at. Whilst you're here though, have you subscribed to Dicebreaker on YouTube? We've got all kinds of fantastic videos here on our channel, from Let's Plays to more reviews like this, lists and recommendations, and we live stream every week to boot. You'll even see videos popping up on screen right about now for you to check out, but you could also head over to our home at dicebreaker.com for some excellent written articles, or dicebreaker.myshopify.com for some lovely DB merch. But for now, thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a lovely day.